This is the first in a series of vodcasts on photosynthesis. Before we go into the details of all the different steps of photosynthesis, it always pays to start with kind of an overview of what photosynthesis is and where it takes place. So at some point in your biology career, you learned kind of a general equation for photosynthesis, and we're going to go over that first. I always like to think about photosynthesis in terms of if we're trying to um, raise some plants, trying to grow some plants, what kinds of things do we need to make those plants grow? All right, so that's going to be our inputs into our reaction for photosynthesis. So if we're growing plants, we need to give them sunlight. We need to give them water. And we need to make sure that they have carbon dioxide, air. Now remember, plants also go through respiration. So they also need oxygen to make ATP. But this is only for photosynthesis. So we're looking at our, our reactants for this as sun energy, water, and carbon dioxide. And what are they going to make with those things that they're provided? The main product of photosynthesis, the purpose of going through it, is to make glucose. This is sugar for the plants. As you well know, we can eat our glucose. We can eat our food and get glucose out of it. Plants cannot do that. They have to make their own glucose and then get the energy from that. Okay, so they're making glucose and also as a byproduct, some oxygen. So there's our general equation for photosynthesis. So as we go through these processes, then to look at why do we need sunlight, why do we need water, and why do we need carbon dioxide. And then also keep in mind where are we giving off glucose and where are we giving off oxygen gas. Okay, so general equation is taken care of. Now we're going to move on to where does this take place. Photosynthesis can take place in any organism that has chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are what give the green structures on plants their color. But remember, photosynthesis can also take place in some protist organisms and also in some bacteria. So anything that has chloroplasts is going to be able to do this. If we look through these diagrams, you don't have to sketch these out yet. I'll show you in a minute what I want you to draw. I just want you to follow the diagrams to begin with. We're going to look at one leaf. A cross-section of that leaf, so from the side, shows that we've got many of these various <clears throat> green structures inside the leaf. Okay, Those are cells that have chloroplasts in them. If we look at one cell, we can see that there are many chloroplasts within that cell. And then if we look at one chloroplast, that's what we're looking at here. So this is one chloroplast. You can see there's these stacks of kind of green pancake looking things in there. Okay, those are pigmented or they're green because they have chlorophyll in them. So the green equals chlorophyll. We'll talk more about chlorophyll and why that's so important later. But it's a special chemical that is really good at absorbing sunlight, at absorbing photons. Okay, then we have all these different stacks of um, green chlorophyll colored organelles that I was telling you about. Those stacks are called a granum, or grana for many of them. Okay. Each grana is made of many thylakoids. And those thylakoids is where we're going to be spending most of our time in these processes of photosynthesis. Okay, so part of your assignment is to diagram some of these structures um, for photosynthesis. Your book also has a pretty good diagram of this, but basically what you're going to be looking at is this chloroplast level here and drawing out where we find the chlorophyll, the grana, and the thylakoids. Check your assignment for what exactly your diagram needs to be, though. Okay, so now that we have kind of a road map here, going to go to separating them out, so separating photosynthesis out into 
two separate reactions. Kind of like when we did cellular respiration and there were three major steps, glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and then electron transport and oxidative, uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So in this one, we're going to talk about two steps. We call them the light reactions and then the light independent reactions, um, which is also called, I'll put this in there right now, the Kelvin cycle. Right, so it has two names. The light independent versus light reactions give you a clue as to what's going on with those reactions, so I like to use those names as well. Okay, so the light reactions. Where do the light reactions actually occur? They occur on the thylakoid membrane. Okay, so if we go back to that drawing that I was looking at earlier, the diagram, we had those stacks of pancakes. Each one was called a thylakoid. So it's that actual membrane of the thylakoid okay, along the edge of it where our light reactions are taking place. The purpose of the light reactions. Get my pen back here. Okay, the purpose of the light reactions is to make ATP and NADPH for the Calvin cycle. Now we're familiar with ATP already. Okay, this is something we've talked a lot about. ATP is what cells use for energy. Right, the Calvin cycle is going to need a little bit of energy to make the glucose in the end. And so the ATP is produced in the light reaction to be used for those um, reactions that help to make the glucose. NADPH sounds kind of like NADH, which we saw in cellular respiration. And it does have a similar function. Okay? It carries along or it carries around the hydrogen ions. See this hydrogen stuck right on the end? To where they need to be so that they can help reactions happen later on. And we'll talk about what those reactions are in the Kelvin cycle. So again, the first step of this in photosynthesis, kind of like cellular respiration, is to prepare some materials that are going to be used later on. NADPH, as I said, is very similar to NADH. It just has an extra phosphate group, so it has a similar function. And the ATP has the exact same function, provides energy. So the light reaction is a preparation step that happens across the thylakoid membrane. The light independent reaction, or the Kelvin cycle, occurs in what's an area called the stroma. Okay. The stroma is the place that goes around, or the filling that goes around the granum. So if these are stacks of pancakes, these are grana. Okay, inside one chloroplast. All of this area surrounding them is the stroma. All right, the purpose of the light independent reactions is to make glucose. Remember that was the overall goal of photosynthesis and this is where it actually happens. So the ATP and the NADPH that's made in the light reactions gets used to make glucose in the light independent reaction or the Kelvin cycle. All right, now we can move on to the light reaction in particular and how those reactions actually happen. Okay, this is a very overwhelming diagram and I do not want you to draw anything immediately. What I'd like you to do is kind of travel with me as I go through it on this journey of what's happening 
And then when I'm all done, I'll go back and kind of diagram out for you what you might want to put into your notes to help you remember what's going on. But it's easiest, I think, if someone explains it to you first and you just follow along and not be so crazy about writing everything down immediately. All right. So we start at the beginning with sunlight. A sunlight has photons in it. So you can think of light as a particle. So when sunlight over here hits our chloroplast, so our chloroplast, remember, has all sorts of little green pigments in it, or chlorophyll. It's going to bounce around, that's what these little arrows here are showing, from one chlorophyll pigment to another inside that chloroplast. Okay, so the chloroplast itself has many different types of green chlorophyll in it. And chlorophyll, as I said earlier, is really good at absorbing photons. It's a special chemical, special molecule, usually has some protein associated with it that can absorb sunlight very easily and move those, um, that energy from the sunlight into energizing electrons. Okay, so sunlight doesn't have electrons in it, but the electrons in chlorophyll can absorb that sunlight very easily and then get more energized. So these arrows here represent the movement of this energized um, sun energy moving electrons between different chlorophyll molecules. The chlorophyll that is kind of the super chlorophyll, the best of all the chlorophylls in this particular area of the chloroplast is right here. You don't have to know this P680, but it's a, it's a really powerful chlorophyll molecule that can boost electrons to a very high energy level. Okay? You can think of electrons, as I said at one point back in the uh, respiration notes, as a hot potato. Okay? Potatoes can be cooked and be really, really, really hot, or if you let them sit on your plate too long, they lose all their heat and they get cold again. But if you put, uh, put them in the microwave, you can heat them back up, and then if you let them sit for a while, they lose their heat again. That's where that idea of that game hot potato comes from, right? As you pass the potato, it loses heat. Electrons are the same way. Your electron is your potato. You can heat it up to different levels of heat, you know, like a lukewarm potato, a really hot potato. But after a while, it'll lose its energy as well. Right? So a potato will lose its heat. So this electron right here has been superheated, if you want to think about it in potato terms. It has lots of energy in it. Um, and we can use that energy to do stuff. 